without further ado, I'm going to invite and help me welcome Dr. Peter Wins for our fourth installment of Signs of the Times. Good evening. I'm excited about this topic of the Signs of the Times. You know, my grandfather, Derek Prince, taught so many things that were so significant in the world. He taught the church to love Israel. He taught about demons and demonology and about prayer. Most of the prayer movements have some connection with the teaching from Derek Prince, whose book was Changing History Through Prayer and Fasting. But Grandpa Derek never spoke a lot about the end times uh, from the book of Revelation and such. And I'm not quite sure because he was uh, a genius when it comes to teaching the Word of God. Uh, but uh, I'm following in his footsteps and carrying on with the themes that he taught. But also, I have written a book which most of you have read uh, called Unexpected Fire, which is the powerful study of the book of Revelation. It's not typical. And I know that we're going to have a big change with uh, our understanding of the book of Revelation in days to come um, because it's going to evolve. We're going to study the Word and, and see it more clearly. Well, this is our fourth night for Signs of the Times. And in our first night, I talked to you about the great shaking because the Scripture says uh, in Hebrews, once more, the Lord says that He will not only shake the, heaven, the earth, but also the heavens. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken, so that those things which cannot be shaken will remain. And then he says, so we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have reverence and awe with, with God, for our God is a consuming fire. And to worship the Lord with, with honor and, and reverence. So the, that was the great shaking. We talked about this last 100 years with the two world wars and all the wars since, and communism stretching out uh, to cover a third of the population on the earth and the Nazis and all that they did in the Second World War and all the kingdoms crashing down uh, with the Chinese kingdom and the czars of Russia and the British Empire. All the empires of the world have crashed down in this last 100 years. We've experienced a great shaking. The greatest of all shakings is still to come. We call it the Great Tribulation. And the Lord says that uh, one of the purposes for this great shaking is so that the things of the kingdom of God will stand. And you don't need to be afraid of the shakings uh, because you're unshakable. You're with Jesus. He's watching over you. He's protecting you. And it's amazing. The second study that we did on the signs of the times was Israel's God's prophetic time clock. And we studied uh, Israel's coming back to having a nation after almost 2,000 years without having a nation and then prophesied in the Bible 47 different times, 47 different places that by oath God says I'll bring you, I'll give you back your land, I'll bring you back to your land and at the end of the day we know Jesus comes and puts his throne amidst the people of Israel on the temple mount in a newly built temple and there he will rule and reign the whole universe. And for a thousand years, he's going to reign here on the earth. And so that was study number two as we, we studied Israel. If you need to, to get these, they're online, but you can also get a CD of these messages. And then last week, we talked about the end time reformation because we realized that 501 years ago, there was a Protestant reformation. But it was a reformation, you know, which we kind of uh, connect with Martin Luther. And it was a reformation for salvation. Uh, so that the church learned that salvation comes not by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And it was going back to the early church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And so that was the words of Martin Luther uh, as, he, as he got it from the scriptures. And for 500 years, the evangelical church has done well to understand that that's how you get saved. But we only had a halfway reformation 500 years ago. It was a salvation 
Reformation. It was not a Holy Spirit Reformation or a government of God with fivefold ministries Reformation. And so last week we talked about one of the signs of the times is that there will be uh, the other half of the Reformation and it will come to us. It's already started. It's been happening for about a hundred years since the Pentecostal revivals uh, in, in the Welsh revival and, and, and the Pentecostal Azusa Street revivals and then the Pentecostal movement. You know there's now 700 different Pentecostal denominations in the world. And then we found the charismatic movement where the mainline churches embraced the move of the Holy Spirit. We also discovered during this time that there's becoming a love that's growing and growing for God's purposes with Israel. And also the fivefold ministries which hadn't been talked about really at any great length for thousands of years are now becoming more and more uh, in our teaching. Although it's people on the cutting edge who are talking about apostles and prophets in a real mature way. So these are three of the end time signs. This series has five different messages. So tonight is number four and then we've got one more. And I want to just tell you, I'm not going to tell you what uh, the next one is going to be, but I'm going to tell you it's the most exciting of them all. And so I will not be here next uh, Wednesday um, because I will be in Miami, but there will be a Bible study. Uh, but the following Wednesday I will be here to conclude this series on the signs of the times. Now, <clears throat> as mentioned, we are in study number four. The title of this message is Wars, Earthquakes, Famines, and Plagues. All right? And I, I called it this uh, because it, it, what we're going to do is take a look at the beginning of these things at, at a powerful end of time great tribulation event. And we're going to go through probably the most, besides the book of Revelation, the most famous chapter in the Bible on the end of, of the age and the signs of the times. Can anybody tell me what it is? Matthew, that's right. Matthew chapter 24. The words of Jesus. And I want to take you through this study going through the first 30th, 30 verses or so of the book of, of Matthew chapter 24. And I want to take you chronologically and show you exactly what Jesus said. What comes first, then what comes, then what comes. Because you know, the book of Revelation, who gave us the book of Revelation? It was the apostle John. But where did he get it from? It says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave to the angel who gave it to John. So Jesus and the angel give the revelation of Jesus Christ, the end of the age, the great tribulation period, the destruction of the devil, the promises of God coming to the church and to Israel, the resurrection of the dead, the second coming of Christ, and the millennial reign on the earth. This book of Revelation is the fulfillment of the cross. Jesus paid for it all on the cross. The book of Revelation shows us how in detail the final things for the last seven years take place until Jesus himself comes and sets his throne on the earth and rules and reigns for a thousand years. So this book of Revelation was given to John from Jesus. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that Matthew 24, which are the words of Jesus, concerning the last days and the book of Revelation should line up together because they came from the same Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the apostle from heaven, the son of the living God, your savior, the greatest apostle, the greatest evangelist, the greatest prophet. And so what we're going to do is go through these verses in the book of Matthew and then we're going to just flip to the book of Revelation and see how both of them go step by step in chronological order. I think this will be, for some of you who haven't heard me teach on this subject, it will be a revelation to you. A revelation on revelation. And uh, I ask you, just for tonight, if you've already been taught about the end times and you are absolutely convinced about some things, do me a favor and just put all of that on the chair beside you. And uh, as if you never learned anything. Then if you don't like what I say, you can pick it up and take it home with you. Uh, you. You know, what you have learned from before. 
So I'm going, if you haven't heard me teach this, will be challenging, maybe challenging to you. But it's going to come right out of the scriptures. So let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and let's have a delicious time in the word of God. Shall we? I'm going to read starting in verse 3. Matthew 24 and verse 3. It says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. I like what it says in some translations. It says, but do not be afraid. And a lot of Christians are really afraid, aren't they, of the end times. So the Lord says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Other translations say, but the end is not yet. Just because you see wars and hear of rumors of wars, that doesn't mean the end has come. He says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask you to help us tonight as we look in your word. We thank you that you're the one who spoke these words and were put down in the scriptures by three of your special disciples. We say thank you, Lord. Help us now to receive all that you're teaching us. and We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, these same words are written by Mark in Mark's gospel. You can read the Mark chapter 13 and verse 8. And also in Luke's gospel. Luke wrote this same account because these disciples were with Jesus and you, they're called the synoptic gospels because these three men, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were there when Jesus was walking on the earth with his disciples when he was teaching and they, they heard and saw and made the, the, rec the record of what they saw and heard and put it down. So it's slightly different. The wording is slightly different. The events are the same. The teaching is the same. But they're being written by different people. And so uh, they all three of them talk about this wars and rumors of wars and the nations rising against nations and famines and earthquakes and such. So this is the beginning. We have not uh, come to this yet. I want you to know that when this happens, they will all come at once. There will be wars and famines and uh, plagues. Um, and they will, will come in such ferocity that you will know this is that. And I want to show you this. Keep your finger there because we're going to be coming back to this scripture all night long. All right, but let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1 because there we see Jesus starting to open up the seals on the scroll that begins, that releases the beginning of the great tribulation. And remember what he says, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes. And he says, this is not the end. This is the beginning. This is the beginning. So the beginning of this great tribulation period starts with these four horses that are released. So we read, I watched, this is verse 1 of chapter 6 of Revelation. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked and there before me was a white horse. And its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out uh, to conquer. And he was bent on conquest. Now, this white horse, he has a task. His job is to call, call the world and call heaven to war. And this is what happens with all nations when they declare war. Um, I remember watching the documentary where really the, the Second World War was started. And the Germans 
went to Poland and they, they attacked Poland and the British government uh, in England, the British government said, we're going to give you such and such a time until the end of this day to get out of Poland. And if you don't get out, we will be at war with Germany. And it came right through to the, to the end of the day. And the <clears throat> Prime Minister of England said, Germany has not pulled out of Poland, nor have they called us, or in any way made communication with you. So as of this moment, we are now at war with Germany and the Nazi party. So that's what that white horse is. He snaps the universe to attention. He doesn't have a weapon. He has a bow but no arrows. But he's set out on conquest and that's what he starts. And then it says in verse 3 that the lamb opened the second seal. Halfway through the verse it says, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and he was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men kill each other. And he was given a large sword. So this is war. And then it says in verse 5 that the lamb, that is Jesus, opened the third seal. And then it says halfway through that verse, there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales. And it talks about famine, that there will, there will be, it will cost a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Um, and then we go to verse 7. It says, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, um, verse 8, it says, I looked and there before me was a pale horse or a gray horse. It says in some translations, its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. And this is the, the curse of plagues. And it, we read there that they, these four horses, were given power over a quarter, a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. So this is the same picture at the very beginning of Jesus' explanation in Matthew 24 about the signs of the times and the end of the age. He says there will be wars and rumors of wars and plagues and famines and earthquakes. And now we read that as the great tribulation starts, it starts as Jesus peels these seals off of the scroll that's in the hand of God Almighty. And the first four seals that he, he pulls off releases four uh, angelic horses, spirit horses from heaven. If you want to read more about these horses, you go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 6. And you will find that before the Lord in his presence are these horses and there and it says the same colors it says there's a white one a black one uh, a red one and there is um, a gray one and it says they go out from the presence of the Lord spirit sent by God into all the earth so these are spirit horses and you know Jesus when he returns he's going to come riding on a horse and it says all the all the armies of heaven riding on white horses too. So there's a lot of these spirit horses in heaven. There's billions of them. Yeah, how many of you know how to ride a horse? Uh, because you should learn. Uh, because you're going to be riding one one day, I imagine. Uh, but I'm sure when you get to heaven, you'll be a quick study. And even if you've never ridden a horse before, you're going to be uh, quite all right uh, riding that horse through the universe and down to the earth on that day when the Lord returns. So, here we see these four apocalyptic horses. And they are going to work together. See, that's the, see we, there's always been famines, always been wars, and always been earthquakes and plagues. But we haven't seen them all together at one time in a catastrophic kind of level. And that's what this great revelation book tells us that at the very beginning of the great tribulation you have plague and famine and war and <clears throat> they're all there at the same time and it says and they were given power to kill a quarter of the people on the earth so if there is approaching eight billion people on the earth and one out of four people are going to die 
That means two billion people die. One out of every four people will die. And they'll die from war and famine and plague. When this happens, it'll happen in a space of about a year. We know that because we study the book of Revelation. We know in four different places it tells us that it takes seven years to be accomplished. And so we know by looking at the various things that take place that it's approximately within the first year that these plagues and famines and wars take place. You need to know that there will be such a protection over the people of God during this time. It will be a supernatural kind of protection that will be over God's people. And uh, we'll see more of that as we go on. So let's go back to the book of Matthew now. Uh, Matthew 24. And uh, I'm going to continue reading. All right. <clears throat> so number one thing. Um, is that there will be natural disasters. Like wars and plagues. Um, and famines. All right. Then of course war is not a natural disaster. It's a man made one. Uh, so there'll be natural disasters first <coughs> and wars and plagues as well. And this happens at the beginning of this great tribulation. Know what, notice what else it says that uh, these are the beginnings. The end is not yet. This is just the beginning. The beginnings of birth pains. Now what are birth pains for? All you ladies know that birth pains are there because you're going to have a baby. You don't have birth pains uh, guys don't have birth pains. Uh, unless it's something spiritual they're birthing. Uh, but in the natural, guys don't. But the ladies who are moms all know about birth pains. And um, I'm not going to get sidetracked to tell you some good stories uh, with Joy and I in the delivery room. That maybe will happen another day. Uh, but birth pains are there because somebody's going to be born. So the Lord tells us that wars, rumors of wars, all of these things together, and two billion people dying in the space of about a year, says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. These are the beginnings of birth pains. Um, you know, I, I look at this Kavanaugh uh, hearing right now in the United States Senate, and uh, I really believe that this lady, uh, Dr. Ford, has had some traumatic experience in her life. Her, her account was quite compelling. However, I don't think because the, the details don't line up and nothing else seems to be provable, I don't think it was Mr. Kavanaugh who has this record of being one of the most godly people in the room. You know, I think if, if uh, all things were pulled back and all the senators and all the, pe all the reporters had to discuss what their lives were, were like and they were all put in order from the worst to the best, I think Mr. Kavanaugh would be pretty close to the front of the line with uh, Mike Pence maybe just beating him by an inch, you know. Uh, because this man has all of these years and so many people speaking so well of him and, and nothing else coming out until just two weeks before he is nominated onto the Supreme Court where he might have the opportunity to reverse abortion in this nation. And so I have to say this to you that all of this God knows about. And this very difficult time of intense warfare uh, and certainly there's been a polarization more sharp in this nation but you know what it's done it's caused so many in the church to rise up and say this is not about that that lady no doubt suffered and we have lots of compassion and there shouldn't be that kind of abuse uh, in people's lives and we'll be the first ones to stand up you know if any if anybody comes to me and tells me pastor don't tell anybody but uh, I've been raped uh, the police will be here right away uh, I will never keep that a secret I'll say I'm sorry dear but we're gonna we're gonna do something there's gonna be justice on your behalf and I will be the first one in fact it's the law that a pastor who is given that information is not allowed by law to keep it secret even if he tells the person I won't tell anybody 
He is now obligated. He becomes an accomplice to a crime unless he lets the police. Now, they, you can keep it secret for everybody else, but this thing is a heinous crime. But that's not what this is about. Uh, this is about Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Court being able to overturn that. And the devil hates it. There's a Jezebelic spirit that is against Kavanaugh right now. And uh, don't be fooled uh, by all the stuff that you're hearing that, that says that women should be able to voice their opinion and, 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 and be able to be heard. That's absolutely true, but that's not the issue here. The issue is Roe versus Wade. See the big picture and uh, um, <clears throat> realize also, and my point is this, that I, I heard today that the, the polls tell us that 10% of the people will now vote Republican in this next midterm election because of the Kavanaugh hearings. And the reason is that the church becomes emboldened and they say, we're not going to stand this for this. That anybody who comes up with an accusation automatically makes the other person guilty. And they have to prove their innocence. And there's no way to prove your innocence from something like that 35, 36 years ago. And so what happens is when, when all of this uh, pressure comes, the church actually rises up. And that's exactly what will happen at the end of the age. When wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, the church is going to rise up in this time and be so powerful and so caring and so loving. Um, if you get my book, you can see in more detail where I find that right here in the book of Revelation. But uh, we have to move on. So these are the beginnings of birth pains. These things bring forth something. Just like the church is, is going to experience a new birthing in the United States of America. But it will be persecution and difficulty that will actually cause the church to be birthed afresh in our time. And so we see that's what will be born. These are the beginnings of birth pains. And it will be the end time one new man church that definitely will be born. And then we read on in Matthew chapter 24 and it says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Now this is not the wrath of God. This is not God's judgment. This is persecution from the devil. You know? And what does it produce? It produces martyrs. And all through history they have been there. At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and verse 12 says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end shall be saved. Now I want you to come over to the book of Revelation again. Uh, because we're going to go step by step. And so we see these four apocalyptic horses bringing forth the plagues, the famines, the wars, and the earthquakes. And then it says, in, in uh, number 9, verse 9 of Revelation 6, <clears throat> when he opened the fifth seal, I saw from under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they, they had maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, How long, O Lord, sovereign, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe and were told to wait a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they were uh, had been completed. And so here we see that persecution comes. And uh, that's exactly what it says in Matthew, doesn't it? That after these things, you see this great persecution come. And that's what the next two, actually the next two seals broken, have to do with the martyrs and the persecution. And even the, the martyrs in heaven cry out to God and say, Lord, will you avenge us? And he says, wait a little while longer because more of your brothers have to be persecuted and die for the faith. And uh, I'm not going to explain why, but the explanation is in my book, Unexpected Fire. All right. Um, now let's go back to the book of Matthew. Are you all right going back and forth like this? It's educational. All right. So we come back to the book of Matthew and we read on. 
it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So this gospel, so this is the next thing on this list. We had uh, natural disasters and wars and plagues, and then uh, birth, birth pains, something being born, the end time church, and then we see the persecution, and then we see false prophets and wickedness uh, increasing, and now in verse 14 there we read, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So now, here we were in Revelation chapter 6, right? You're following with me? Now go to chapter 7, and we're going to see the gospel being preached in all the world, just like Jesus said in Matthew. Now he says it, he prophesies it also in the book of Revelation. So we read, um, in verse 4 of, of Revelation 7, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And their names are mentioned, the different tribes. Then we go to verse 9, Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation. Please say every nation tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. So now we see <coughs> there's a huge revival. And there's so many people, the Bible here says, that there's a, there's a multitude that's so big that nobody can count their numbers. Of course, God can, but nobody else can keep track of it. It's kind of like in China right now. And for the last 30 years in China, there's been revival. I've been there, and I preached in the underground church, and I preached uh, in the, for the university professors there, and I, I visited the state church, and you ask them, how many Christians are there here? And in certain parts of China, it's just almost a, a, a huge proportion of the community are born-again believers. Uh, in other parts of China, it's not that way. But, it, but nobody knows for sure how many there are. But now the Bible says from every tongue and every nation and every language, that means Cuba, that means Saudi Arabia, that means Russia, that means Greece, uh, that means Poland, uh, that means Argentina, uh, that means England, that means Germany, that means South Africa, every place in the world, every tongue, every tribe, you know, on the dollar bill, the rupee in in. India, there's 17 different languages that says this is their dollar. And there are 300 different major languages and dialects in India alone. And the Bible says that there are people from every tongue and every language and every people group standing before the throne of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you might say, well, that's just there from all of history. Well, that's not the case. Because you go down to verse 13... It says, then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? And verse 14 says, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. So these are people who got saved in the great tribulation. So I want you to know that the wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and the plagues where two billion people died. I want you to know that a great percentage of them, before they actually died, gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And because this is that. Here they are now, up in heaven. And where did they come from? They came from the great tribulation. And now they're in heaven. And there's so many of them. And they're from all over the world. So they're sinners to start with. And then there's wars and rumors of wars. And, and there's, there's one buddy leading the other one to the Lord. And uh, okay, you're going to go to heaven now. But for all eternity, they're born again. So the greatest revival of all time takes place at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. All right? And that's what the Scripture says here. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, as a testimony. And then the end shall come. Now this here is repeated in Revelation. You think that's the only revival? It's not. Because in Revelation chapter 14... We read in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel 
to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the sea, and the earth, and so on. And then you look at verse 14, in Revelation 14, verse 14, and it says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a, a a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who is seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Now the farmer harvests at the end of the year and what's he doing he's bringing in the crop and so God is the farmer and the end time harvest is mentioned all through scripture and now we see halfway through the book of Revelation the greatest revival of all time it says and the angel swung his sickle and the earth was harvested and the crop of souls goes to be with God Almighty. They get saved. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. All right, so now we go back to Matthew. Matthew 24. Are you with me so far? I didn't lose anyone by the way, did I? All right, so then we go on and we read uh, so when you uh, see standing in the holy place, this is verse 15, the abomination that causes desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. All right? And for time's sake, uh, it talks about the difficulty of those days. And then it says uh, in verse uh, 21, for then there will be a great distress, unequaled, from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again if those days had not been cut short no one would survive but for the sake of the elect that's the believers those days will be shortened so we're reading a few things here one we read that there will be an abomination that causes desolation you know what that is that's the image of the Antichrist that's put up in the temple. The temple will be rebuilt and halfway through the great tribulation, you read it in Revelation chapter 13, it says there that this image of the beast or the Antichrist will be put up in the temple. And this is the abomination that causes desolation as written by Daniel in the book of Daniel, all right? And as we're going through the book of Revelation, just right on cue, you'll see there in chapter 13 where it, it talks about uh, in chapter 13 of Revelation and verse 14, because of the signs the false prophet does, he was given power uh, to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So this is the abomination, the image. And you read through and you'll find out that it gets set up in the temple. And... It's also mentioned in Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians where it says the image of the lawless one gets put up in the temple and the whole world is forced to worship. Of course, Christians will not and nor will really faithful Jews. <coughs> so again, we see this lining up in the middle of the Great Tribulation, after the wars, after the four apocalyptic horses, after the persecution of the church, after the gospel is preached, these are all in order. And these revivals take place, then, this, then the beast emerges for the last half of the book of Revelation, the last half of the Great Tribulation, 
and his image gets put up in the temple. And that's an abomination uh, where the temple is to have the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies and the worship of the Lord. But now you're worshiping the devil there. This is the abomination that causes desolation. The abomination of desolation. And then as we read on after that, it says, and there will be a time of great distress. This is verse 21. For there will be, this is Matthew 24, verse 21. There will be a time of great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and will never be that way, never be equaled again. So what is the only thing, time period, event, that fits that description? That there will be a time of great distress like the world has never seen. And it will never be ever again as bad as that. Well, it's the great tribulation, isn't it? If you study the great tribulation at all, you know it's ten, ten times worse than any other period in history. Maybe a hundred times worse. And once it's done with, we start the, the great millennial rule of Christ. There'll never be another one. So that definitely is speaking so clearly about the great tribulation. And it says that the great tribulation, this great distress, has to be cut short. Why? For the sake of the elect, who the Christians, the believers who are there. Uh, it says um, in verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive because the earthquakes, the wars, the famines, the plagues, everything in the sea is dead. All the vegetation is burned up. There's no drinking water on the surface anymore of the world. And the earthquakes have smashed every building and every city. And the ozone layer is depleted so that your skin blisters. So the Lord says, if those days weren't cut short, no one would survive. But you know what the Bible says? Those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent those who are dead or those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds and so we shall ever be with the Lord. So where is the Lord going? When he comes down to the clouds, and in a twinkling of an eye we're changed, we meet him in the clouds, and we're going to forever be with him. Where's he going? Well, it never says anywhere in the whole Bible that he turns around and goes back to heaven. It actually tells us what he does. It says he comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. And strikes down the nations and tells um, the birds to come and eat the dead bodies of all of those people who are killed. Well, let's go back to Matthew 24 and let's carry on with this end time signs in chronological order. All right? So we read then that no one would survive unless those days are shortened. And uh, at verse 23, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. <coughs> don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to even to, if it's possible, to deceive the, the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So when this happens, you've got to be ready for it. And then in verse 26, so if anyone tells you he's out in the desert, go there, don't go. Because he, if that's not what he's going to do. But in verse 27, it, we read about the coming of the Lord. It says, for, and how it will happen. It says, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. So this is, this is not the book of Revelation now. This is the book of Matthew. We're reading in the book of Matthew, we find out that when the Lord comes, that he strikes down the nations and he calls for the birds to come and eat. Is that right? You with me? So now let's go to the book of Revelation and find this. See, Jesus wrote Matthew, or he, he, he gave these, this description to Matthew, and he's the one who gave the description 
in the book of Revelation. So we go to Revelation 19. Now this is at the end of the book. It's in chronological order just like Matthew's in chronological order. They go step by step. One step after the other. And so we read in Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. It says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. Who is this? Somebody tell me. Yeah, Jesus. That's right. His eyes are blazing fire and his head he has many crowns and his name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God and the armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses. And dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. So when Jesus comes, he's got spirit people with him. And they come to the clouds riding on white horses. And their bodies come up out of the earth. How long does it take for them to get their bodies? It's not as long as a wink. A wink is too long. It's a blink. Or a twink. It's in a twinkling of an eye. Wow, I mean, it's, it's like instant. That, that the dead bodies come up and they're right there. And then Jesus comes down and he makes war. And he strikes down the nations. Um, just as he said in, it happened so quickly. Like as like quickly as the lightning goes from the east to the west. That's how quick it is. Wow, just like that. And he is... Uh, verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. The armies of heaven are with him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword but this to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now look, remember we, he, we read there that then the vultures come? Verse 17 of Revelation. And I saw another angel in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men of horses and their riders of the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Verse 21. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. So this is right in step, isn't it? With Matthew 24. When does Jesus come? Revelation 19. There's only 22 chapters. And it's just the third one from the end where Jesus returns to the earth, strikes down the nations and tells the birds to eat the people, the dead bodies. So, is it Christians or sinners who are getting eaten by birds? Sinners, right? Jesus isn't going to have the Christians get eaten. So the Christians are with him. They got a new body. What happens to the spirits of all those dead people who are sinners? Well, they go for a thousand years to Haiti until the great white throne judgment which comes at the end of the millennium all right and the dead then a thousand years later it says that the dead are raised these dead ones um, now you see what's happening today in the United States of America everything is polarizing and there are a lot of people who don't understand who only who don't have a clear perspective on what's going on but I want you to know that by the time this happens, that it will be so clear. There will be an antichrist. And there will be the church of Jesus Christ with powerful miracles and great revivals. And the evil will become more evil and the godly will become more godly. And so the stakes become much stronger then. Um, and so anyone who takes the mark of the beast, which is, it's not just on your hand or on your head, it's, it's your mindset. It, the mark of the beast just like, you know, is, is in your thinking. And if, and right now, you can see a kind of mark of the beast in many people's thinking. That they don't, they don't get it. They don't understand that a little baby in a womb has to be protected. 
or else it's murder. They don't understand uh, the, the importance of the family and godliness. Uh, you know, so uh, this here is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. We're going to have some revivals before this great tribulation period. However, when it comes, the polarization will be so great. There will be many Christians who will actually move to Israel. And there will be many Christians in the nations who will refuse to get the mark of the beast or bow their knee. In the United States, but by the time Jesus is ready to come, when he comes, there's war on the earth. Read about it in Zechariah chapter 14. Maybe we should turn there, shall we? Let's look at Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to be closing real soon. So I'm glad you've endured this study. But Zechariah chapter 14. And I'm going to start reading to you probably in verse Two. Okay, now let's start in verse 1. Verse 1. Zechariah 14, verse 1. The day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured. Horses, ran, houses uh, ransacked. Women raped. Uh, half the city will go into exile. And the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out to f and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two. And it <laughs> talks about how he rescues the people there at that time. But I want you to see something else in verse 6. It says, on that day, this is Zechariah 14 verse 6. On that day there will be no light. Alright, when Jesus comes there's going to be a day where there is no light. Or cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. But when evening comes, there will be light. All right? Now in verse 9, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Now this is the beginning of his millennial reign. All right? So now let's go back to Revelation. And, oh no, go back to Matthew 24, sorry. And let's finish this up. So Matthew 24, we read, verse 29, immediately after the distress of those days. That is the great tribulation. The distress of those days like has never been known. That's what we're talking about. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Just like we read there in Zechariah when it talks about the Lord coming on that day and landing on the Mount of Olives. It says, and there will be no, no light. It will be dark. And now we read it here in Matthew. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, verse 30, the Son of Man, Matthew 24, verse 30, at that time, after all of this great tribulation period and all of these wars and all of this uh, abomination of desolation and the gospel being preached in the whole world, it says, at that time the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. All right, so the people of God come together to be with Jesus and wherever he is, they're going to be at his side. All right. And then it says, and uh, we've only got to verse 35 and then we're done. Verse 32, now learn the lesson of the fig tree. Now this is a footnote. After the Lord gives us all of these different steps to the end times, the disciples said, tell us about your coming and the end of the age. And then he gives it to them. Fourteen different things in order. The exact same order as the book of Revelation. And then he says, now learn the lesson of the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away 
until all these things have happened, until all these things, including the return of the Lord, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So after giving this chronological picture of the end of the age and what happens, the Lord says, now learn the lesson of the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. A certain man planted a fig tree in the middle of his vineyard. And for three years, he came looking for fruit on it. That's Jesus coming to Israel. But he didn't find it, right? And the Lord <coughs> says, when he's going into a town, he comes looking for fruit on the fig tree. And there isn't any fruit on it. And he curses the tree. And the disciples come out the next day and they say, look, master, the, the, the fig tree that you cursed is withered up. And he says, have faith in God. Why would he say that? Because one day, that tree is going to come back to life again. And the whole message of Matthew here, Matthew 24, learn the lesson of the fig tree. When you start to see the figs, that's Israel, sending forth, just start, sending forth its tender twigs and its new leaves, know that the time is at hand. And that from that moment, there won't be one generation pass until the Lord's return and all of these things that were talked about shall be fulfilled. So, was it 1948? Well, 1948 was the time when the physical twigs and branches for Israel started to come back. But I suggest to you that the Lord's talking about the spiritual leaves on the fig tree. So from the moment that Israel has a revival and a great percentage of them, their eyes are opened and they see that Jesus is Messiah, from that moment, a generation will not pass before the return of the Lord and all of these things will happen. So one of the signs at the beginning of the Great Tribulation is a Jewish revival. The fig tree starting to come alive again and send forth its leaves. And from that moment, well, we know the book of Revelation teaches us that the Great Tribulation is seven years. So the Jews are going to get saved near the beginning, many of them, although not all, but many. And from that moment, the Great Tribulation will begin. We'll see the wars, the rumors of wars, the four apocalyptic horses. We'll see the persecution of the church and many martyrs. We'll see the gospel being preached in all the kingdom and the greatest revivals of all time. We'll see the abomination that causes desolation. Chapter 13 of Revelation, the Antichrist and his image. And then we'll see the Lord himself coming. Revelation 19. And telling, striking down the nations. And telling the birds to come and eat the dead bodies. And then there's darkness, just like it says. In all of these different places, darkness covers the earth. On that day when the Lord comes. And he stands on the Mount of Olives with all of the saints with him. And then he rules and he reigns. And the age comes to an end and a new age begins. So tonight, I've given you the upcoming signs of the times. You know, you see it in the air. You see us getting ready for that. And as we move into it, there, there will be more and more of a polarization in the United States of America. And at the end, Israel and the church will be the one new man church and the one new man church and the whole world will gather together in the valley of Armageddon to march against Jerusalem. The whole world. 200 million soldiers. The world will be so polarized and the church 
and redeemed Israel will fight. And in the middle of the battle, the Lord himself shall come. On a white horse. When he gets to the clouds, the dead in Christ will rise. Back on the earth in a twinkling of an eye, just like that. And he'll strike down the nations, call the birds to eat them. And then he'll throw the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And he'll take Satan and put him in the pit for a thousand years. And then he will rule over the nations with his people for a thousand years. So those are signs of the times. I hope it's as clear as can be to you. I encourage you to get my book, which is called Unexpected Fire, and go through it with your Bible open, and you'll see so much more. Because it takes me about 30 hours to teach what I've taught you tonight in one hour. Please stand to your feet. Two weeks' time, we're going to finish this series and give you the final study on the signs of the times. And uh, by the end of it, you should be absolutely amazing, genius, end of times um, explainers to all those who don't have it clear. All right. Hold your hands, please. Would you pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, help me to be in step with you and to see the victory of the end times and the glory of God. Even today, let your church be emboldened. Let that which is holy be more holy and let that which is unholy be more unholy. Lord, let it become clear the kingdom of our God and Lord, we say that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. We stand with you for your purpose. And we receive your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your heart and I'm going to pray for you. And then those who are able, we invite you to come to the front here to have an hour of prayer. My wife Joy is going to lead that time of prayer to pray for the nation, to pray for Kavanaugh, to pray for the Supreme Court, to pray especially for this upcoming midterm election. Now in the name of Jesus, I speak the blessings of the Lord over your life. I open the doors for your future. And I speak the blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over you. I put the covering of, of the Lord and the peace of God over you. The joy of the Lord in your heart. And I speak blessings on you and your marriage. I speak the blessings of God on your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I break off every curse and every dark design against you. And I release the goodness and the favor of God the visitation of angels, and his love to surround you. I speak it over you in Jesus' name. Good night, and God bless you.